Our reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be your old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it, in, it over a fire, with the head, legs and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Our second reading is from Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. Amen. Grace and peace to you, United Church, and welcome to Worship This Sunday. We're looking at a particularly interesting text today, and it's a text on conflict resolution, discipline, on uh, the way in which we should exercise discipline in the church. But uh, we're going to examine it a little and just look in the, at the way in which Jesus um, teaches us about these important things. Of course, the other text we've read today is the text of the Exodus, the beginning of the Exodus. But we're going to look at that another week. Um, it's something that's just really pas I'm passionate about, and it's close to my heart the birth of Judaism as we know it. Now, um, there are a few things happening in our church. We're going to be having a bazaar at the end of October. Love to be you to be a part of it. If you want to be a part of it, get to hold of the church office. We're also having a golf day in November, 16 November, and uh, we'd also love you to be part of that if you'd like to come and play some golf with us, donate something towards the golf day, or just be part of the general, the, the um, celebration of that particular day, which is a, a meal at Jim and Val Golf Course. We'd love you to be part of our, um, our ongoing ministry. If you're not part of a home group, we have seen some growth in our home groups recently and we'd love you to be part of that ministry. Now, um, as we come to this text, let's pray because it's particularly sensitive that the Lord would guide us into truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have your word which we can interrogate and examine but also that we can allow it to do work on our hearts and tr transform us. And so open the eyes of our hearts that we may truly see Jesus in everything we read. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, folks, we at United Church believe the scriptures are where we find the word of God. Um, but more than that, we believe that when we read the scriptures, we reliably hear the word of God. So it's, it's more than just a place we dip into to find the word of God, but actually... Every time we read the scriptures, we know that the Spirit inspires us to hear the living, breathing word, the word of God. And uh, this particular text today is, is an interesting one because it's, it's teaching us a few things, but, but mainly how to discern whether 
somebody is um, within the bounds of decency and morality in the way they treat us. And uh, so Jesus gives us particularly harsh teaching. The teaching says essentially if somebody sins against you, you approach them personally, privately, confidentially, and uh, hopefully they, they will confess and agree with you. Um, we're not talking about somebody who just dis disagrees with you. We're talking about somebody who is actually committing um, what is tantamount to, to some kind of crime against you. And then uh, we, the second one is that if they don't listen to you, you take along to others. And if not, they, don't, they still don't listen, then you take the elders of the church. Then finally, if they don't listen to that, just treat them as a, a pagan or a tax collector. And that's an interesting thing we'll look into a little bit as we go on. But I want us to start as we look at this text at um, the, the way it's couched in the Gospel of Matthew. First of all, just before this, is this, this story the, or the parable in the sense of the lost sheep, where Jesus says, um, if a shepherd loses a sheep, one of a hundred, he would leave the hundred, the ninety-nine, and go and find the one, um, because he would celebrate of you know finding the one uh, more than just having the ninety-nine. So it is about God's intention to seek and to save the lost. For for God, every single one who can be returned is a celebration, and the same for us. If we can bring a brother or sister to back into the fold to be reconciled. That's the primary intention of all of this. But also after this text, which is about the discipline, we find another, another teaching of Jesus, which is about forgiveness. And somebody asks Jesus how many times they ought to forgive. And Jesus says, forgive seven times, 70 times, which, which both of these two stories before and after this one on discipline throw into stark relief Jesus' idea of discipline. So let's interrogate this text, first of all, in terms of its uniqueness in the Jewish faith. Remembering, of course, Jesus is teaching Jews here, not Christians. He's not preaching in a Christian pulpit, but he's teaching the Jewish people in Israel. And when he teaches them, this is particularly unique because of the way that traditionally um, court cases, uh, matters of discipline would have been dealt with. Now, in ancient Israel, there were three ways in which a court case was dealt with. One was the um, the oracle, in which case there would be either a prophet who would be consulted to give wisdom on whether a case is, a person is guilty or not. Um, the oracle could also include um, some kind of chance element. So the umim and tumim of the Old Testament, which we read about in Deuteronomy and the other legal books, um, they were kind of a dice which was thrown. First of all, you prayed and then you threw the dice and you believed that that, that lot which fell would be um, of God. He would, he would determine how it would fall, and so it would determine if the person's guilty or innocent. Now you can imagine that that's, that oracle is um, it's unreliable in human terms, and certainly wouldn't be accepted in modern um, judicial systems. The, the second one would be ordeal. Now an ordeal would be where a, a person was required to follow through some kind of uh, test in order to prove their innocence, um, of course, we find these stories from the Spanish Inquisition in the Middle Ages where people would be forced to um, be bound and thrown into a river, and if they survived, they were innocent. If they didn't, they were guilty. Now, it was a similar thing, this ordeal, and a person might be put through some kind of test in order to show their innocence or guilt. Um, and uh, it was not uncommon in, in ancient Israel for this kind of thing to happen. Now Moses, not Moses, Solomon uses this kind of, um, employs this kind of tactic with the two women who come with the child. And the ordeal he puts them under is how strong is your love for your child? And he says, let's you know, cut the child in half. And of course, the one who loves the child deeply says, don't, don't cut the child in half. We, we, you know, I couldn't bear to see the child hurt. Now, um, the, the third way in which the trial could be held would be in terms of an oath. So you have the, the, the oracle, uh, you know, uncertain. You have the, the ordeal, which is uh, cruel, to say the least. And then we have the oath. And the oath would be where a person might be expected to, to give an oath to say they were innocent. Of course, an oath could also include witnesses. And this is where the book of Deuteronomy, De Deuteronomy particularly has a, a judicial system in which witnesses were used 
One witness, witness was not considered a credible witness. Jesus here says the, the testimony of two or three witnesses. Two witnesses were considered a, a very solid case, but three witnesses signed, sealed and delivered. That was the, the end of the case, if there were three witnesses. And one of the, one of the compelling um, uh, uh, kind of correctives of the system of the oath, where there were witnesses allowed, Pretty, you know, in a sense, very simple form of our judicial system, where a person might um, would would be attended to, well, witnesses would be called. People were afraid to bear witness if if they were uncertain, because the the law was was in a sense retroflexive. It was um, it was so that if you testified against somebody, uh, but you, they, they were then proven later proven innocent, you could actually be punished with the same punishment they would have been punished with. So um, you, people were very careful about testifying against others because if those people were found to be innocent in the end, you could be punished along with them. So these three um, forms of, of trial existed in ancient Israel. And Jesus comes with an entirely new one. It's one which is risky for the one who is offended. It's one in which a personal... Um, a personal interaction has to take place and then only are others called into the system and ultimately the, it's handed over to those who would be the leaders, the, the church. Of course, Jesus doesn't use the word church, he uses the word community, and by that he would mean the, the, the temple community, the leaders of the temple. Now, um, in Jesus' trial, he uses the idea of the oath, the idea of the oath or the idea of, uh, idea of a trial like we would have, but he, um, it's, it's quite unique in that he, he requires somebody to, first of all, personally and confidentially approach somebody else. And that is a trial mechanism is, is quite unheard of in ancient Israel because you would, it would be kept in personal, much like you know, our courts are. You can charge somebody without having even met them. So Jesus, the point of this really is it's restorative discipline. It's a discipline which aims at restoring relationships and forgiving. But here's the thing. Right at the beginning, it says if someone sins against you, they, the, the word for sin there is, there are two words for sin in the New Testament, particular words, many more in the Old Testament, but two, two particular words for sin. And the one is uh, to transgress. It's a word which means to, to step over a line or to deliberately break a law. The second word, and that's the word that's used here, is the word hamartia. And hamartia means, um, it's an archery term, which means that your, your sights are off, you know, your, or your arrow is skewed, and you constantly miss the target. And it basically it could mean something as simple as somebody having a bad attitude towards you, somebody who refuses to see their fault in terms of their attitude towards you. They may not have actually done something wrong. They may not have committed that crime against you, a crime, but they simply have a bad attitude, which is destructive of human relationships. And uh, that's quite enlightening in terms of the way Jesus teaches on these things, that, that actually he is, he is so particular about the way we live with one another, that it's not just about the obvious things we would do against one another, but actually the attitudes of our hearts. So Jesus, in this section, is not necessarily giving us a formula for how a, a legal disciplinary process sh should happen with, with our communities. But he's highlighting the fact that God's primary uh, goal in any kind of discipline is to restore relationships, to, to bring back the lost sheep, to bring reconcile people to one another. But also, um, even within a context where somebody has been hurt by another, and where discipline is appropriate, uh, Jesus says, we forgive seven times, 70 times. But within that, he gives us this, this freedom to speak to somebody personally and then to bring others into a conversation so that we might restore and clear the air of brokenness in a community. But then he also says, if the system is ultimately broken down, treat them as uh, a Gentile, or a tax collector. And Gentiles and tax collectors were, were not allowed to eat with Jewish people. They were considered unclean or impure. And so they were excluded from the fellowship of the people. And one of the things here, folks, is that 
Jesus gives the freedom to to exclude. I'm so careful here because we we ought to be careful not to exclude people on a whim. But he does give us the freedom to to prevent someone from stealing the joy of a community. And we have those people in our communities, folks. And none of you, of course, I'm, I'm speak, not speaking about any of you who are watching this, um, but we do have those in our communities who steal joy, whose mean-spiritedness would steal the very joy from the hearts of children and do not consider uh, community and fellowship more important than, than themselves and their pride or their ego. And folks, Jesus is saying, be very careful of those because they will rob you of your joy and your ability to serve him. Um, so, so with those two caveats, firstly, that Jesus is all about bringing back the lost. Um, and secondly, that he is about forgiving seven times, 70 times. Even that person who would be treated as a Gentile and pagan, um, Gentile and, and uh, um, tax collector, if they repented to re re restore them to fellowship every single time, he, within the, the context of those two caveats, Jesus does give us within the Christian faith the ability to deal kindly, confidentially, confidentially, restoratively, but also carefully protecting the joy of our communities from those who would steal, them, steal the joy. So I hope this has been useful and I hope we can look a little differently, perhaps the kind of discipline that Jesus asks us to exercise in our communities. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.